on this Monday, September 24th. When he first came in, he was really agitated. He was yelling, screaming, swearing. He wasn't, he wasn't happy at all that he was taken into custody. Police officer Jason Van Dyke's defense attorneys call their first witnesses to the stand. We want to have transparency. We want to have openness. And I look forward to meeting with Rod at that time. So is he fired or still on the job? What to expect from Thursday's meeting between the president and Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein after a day of conflicting news reports. I think it's important not just for the elections coming up, but just so that people have another avenue to ensure that their voices are being heard in our democracy. Why automatic voter registration in Illinois has stalled. School sports are back and so are concussion concerns. A new test out of Northwestern uses sound to identify brain injury. We are ahead of schedule, which I'm glad to say. The ruins of the former Pilgrim Baptist Church in Bronzeville get an all-star boost on the way to becoming a gospel museum. And as summer fades away, fall planting tips from our friends at the Chicago Botanic Garden. All that and more next on Chicago Tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Paris Schutz. A judge tosses out even more criminal convictions related to a corrupt former Chicago cop. Brandis Friedman has that story and more of what's making news in Chicago tonight. Brandis. In Paris, a Cook County judge has exonerated 18 more men who had been investigated by former Chicago Police Sergeant Ronald Watts. State's attorney Kim Fox says her office moved to vacate the charges against those men after finding patterns of misconduct by Watts and other officers. Fox also apologized to the men for what they've been through. The officers allegedly shook down drug suspects and framed some of them if they didn't pay off the cops. Watts and other, another officer were arrested in 2012 after shaking down a drug courier who turned out to be an FBI informant. Watts received a 22-month sentence. A total of 42 convictions linked to Watts have been tossed since 2016. Members of the General Assembly say they plan to override Governor Bruce Rauner's amendatory veto of a bill they say would help bridge the gender pay gap. House Bill 4163 would have prohibited employers from asking a job applicant's salary history and as much like another bill the governor vetoed last year. Late Friday, the governor used his authority to amend the measure, but those who support it say his changes would still allow employers to discriminate. His amendatory veto removes all penalties from the existing Equal Pay Act, essentially allowing employers to commit wage discrimination with impunity. And he also added language that would give employers who have been shown to commit wage discrimination immunity as long as they conduct an ill-defined self-evaluation. In his veto message, Rauner says, quote, I am committed to eliminating the gender wage gap and strongly support wage equality. I noted in my prior veto message that Massachusetts already has established a best in the country approach to the issue of employers inquiring about salary history. Rauner's amendatory veto therefore allows applicants to volunteer their salary history if asked on an application. It would also allow employers to request salary history once a job offer has been made. The mayor and Chicago public schools are boasting about an increase in the number of students enrolling and persisting in college. The district says more than 64 percent of 2017 graduates enrolled in a two or four year college. That's up almost five percentage points compared to the class of 2016 and a whopping 20 percent increase from the class of 2010. The district also says more students are staying in college with a 72.3 percent persistence rate. You match additional funding with better, with higher expectations, better academic outcomes, and you, the result is that we have more and more kids graduating and going off to college, which is wonderful and great news. The district attributes the enrollment increases to partnering with nonprofits that support students in preparing for college, as well as the STAR Scholarship, which provides free tuition and books for CPS grads who qualify to attend City Colleges of Chicago. As for the weather, a slight chance of showers tonight, otherwise cloudy with a low around 64. Then patchy fog tomorrow and a chance of showers, otherwise mostly cloudy with a high near 79. And when you're on the go, don't forget you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook via podcast and the PBS video app.
as well as online at WTTW.com news. Now, Paris, back to you. Thank you, Brandis. The defense is presenting its case in the Jason Van Dyke murder trial. Defense attorneys called witnesses that testified about the 17-year-old victim, Laquan McDonald's, past behavior. But is all of that really relevant to this case? Chicago Tonight reporter Matt Masterson joins us with the latest from today's proceedings. Matt, get us up to speed. Where are we at in this trial? Well, Paris prosecutors rested their case against Van Dyke last Thursday, so today the defense attorneys started presenting their own case for why they believe Van Dyke was justified and acted in self-defense in shooting Laquan McDonald 16 times. Uh, they, today they started doing that by trying to poke holes in McDonald's autopsy report and also bringing up cases of his past altercations and violent incidents from inside uh, Cook County Juvenile Detention Center where he spent some time. All right, so tell us about the types of witnesses you heard from. There were two types of witnesses who testified today. There were four witnesses total, three of whom worked inside that juvenile corrections facility, which McDonald bounced in and out of in his last years before the shooting. Uh, they, those people testified about separate experiences they had with McDonald throughout 2013 and 2014, in which they attempted to paint McDonald as a violent, aggressive teen who had issues with people in authority. Uh, one said his partner struck McDonald in the stomach when they tried to restrain him, and he resisted. And another working there in 2000. 2014 said that McDonald actually tried to take a swing at him. And what did he do when he got into that room? Uh, I need, well, he used some, I don't like to use the language to you. Go ahead. It was choice words. He's like, I'm going to beat your MF, I'm going to tear your TV up. And he came at me, so I got up, he swung at me, and I was able to grab him and actually pick him up and pin him against the glass partition. So did he hit you? Yes. So Matt, why is this kind of testimony relevant in a case where the cop, Van Dyke, presumably has no idea who this kid is, Laquan McDonald, when he interacts with him? It's called lynch material, and there's actually a Supreme Court case from Illinois that allows this type of evidence to be presented in a case like this where the defendant is claiming that they acted in self-defense. Basically what it allows is that the defense can try to bring up violent history issues with the victim to say that this played some sort of role. Even though, as you said, it's very clear, prosecutors have made it very evident that Van Dyke had no idea about any of these incidents the night of the shooting. So the defense attorneys aren't getting into any legal trouble here presenting this kind of testimony? Correct. It's, it's, it is legal under, under Illinois state law. Okay, so what are some of the other witnesses the defense presented? The only other witness who was called to testify today was was a former pathologist from the Cook County Medical Examiner's Office. Her name is Dr. Shaku Tees, and she was a defense witness. She testified about McDonald's autopsy, and she, her assessment of that autopsy came to some pretty different conclusions than the pathologist who actually performed this autopsy. Shaku Tees did not perform this autopsy. Uh, but she believed that Laquan McDonald was actually standing when the vast majority of the shots that hit him did strike him, um, even though the video of the shooting shows him hitting the ground within only a couple seconds of the first sh shot being fired. And under questioning from Special Prosecutor Jody Gleason, Tease also testified that McDonald likely died within one to five minutes of the shooting. He was actually unresponsive with a very weak pulse that they couldn't even count. And then they got a pulse of 60 per minute. And they, they were actually doing CPR when they, when they got that. They applied an AED, and that's when they got the pulse. And, but he was alive, right? He had a pulse? He was alive if you say that his, he had a heartbeat, but the heart can actually continue to beat for a while when somebody's dead. All right, Matt, you're back at it tomorrow. So I guess the $100 question right now is, will Jason Van Dyke take the stand? That is the big question, and right now we don't really have uh, any idea if it is going to happen. His defense team has not given any indication of whether or not he is or is not going to take the stand. Last week, uh, Kevin Graham, the head of Chicago's Fraternal Order of Police, said that he believes Van Dyke should uh, testify, but he said he has no insight as to whether or not that's going to happen. Um, so like you said, the case is picking back up tomorrow. The defense is not expecting to wrap up its case this week, so this is going to head into its third week before we can think about any type of verdict. And it's important also to note that the shooting actually occurred um, four years ago next month. McDonald was 17 at the time. Tomorrow would have marked his 21st birthday. All right, Matt Masterson, thanks for being here. And we'll, of course, follow uh, all of your updates on our website, wttw.com news. All right, and now to Carol Marine and the job status of Justice Department's second highest ranking official. Carol. Paris, thank you. Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein will meet with President Donald Trump this Thursday. That's after rumors this morning that Rosenstein was about to quit or be fired. 
The latest controversy surrounding Rosenstein, who oversees special counsel Robert Mueller and his Russia investigation, stems from reports that Rosenstein either seriously or sarcastically talked about wearing a wire in the White House. Reports also allege he discussed scenarios for removing Donald Trump from office using the 25th Amendment. Here to discuss what may happen if Rosenstein leaves his post are Juliet Sorensen, professor in international law at Northwestern University Center for International Human Rights. She was an assistant U.S. attorney in Chicago from 2003 to 2010. And Patrick Collins, a partner at King and Spaulding, also a former assistant U.S. attorney here from 1995 to 2007. He led the successful prosecution of former Governor George Ryan. Welcome back, both of you, to Chicago tonight. Patrick, let me start with you. Is there any substantial difference between Rosenstein quitting or Rosenstein being fired? I mean, as a technical matter, I do think there's a question um, about who can replace him. Um, under the Vacancies Removal Act that is in existence. But I, I think as a practical matter, the whole ball game, I think for most of us following this from a distance, is who is going to supervise the Mueller investigation. And from that perspective, uh, the, the key question is who, is who is that going to be? Will it be someone that is going to uh, put the reins on it in a way that hasn't been put before? Or is it someone going to let Mueller get to the finish line, whatever that is? So if he, but as one of the things I was reading, so tell me if this is wrong, if he is fired, there are more hoops to jump in creating his replacement than if he quit. Is that right? I've read the same thing, and I think the, the concept is if you, you can't sort of benefit from firing someone where you could benefit if, if your official resigns. Um, but I think we're, in so many ways, Carol, we're in uncharted territory here. I don't think these specific situations and fact patterns ever came up. In, the, in our in, in Northwestern Law School, Juliet, but we're in uncharted territory. So, but I think the the key question is, uh, and we certainly don't know what's going to happen on Thursday. But again, from my perspective as an observer, the question is who's going to supervise Mueller? And Juliet, is there just a, a normal line of succession if he steps aside or is pushed aside? Well, Patrick is right. This is not the type of fact pattern that I would give in my public corruption in the law exam. Uh, but yes, I expect that the Solicitor General, who is considered to be the number three at the Justice Department, would be the normal line of succession, although there are reports that the Attorney General Jeff Sessions' Chief of Staff would step in at least to oversee the Russia probe, um, which would be somewhat unusual. So the Solicitor General is Noel Francisco, correct? That's right. What correct. do we know about Noel Francisco? You know, he's a, Jones, a former Jones Day partner, and I think what's been raised with Noel Francisco is that his firm has represented the Trump Committee uh, in the Mueller probe. And in those circumstances, typically, the Department of Justice would have to issue a waiver to allow him to sit in that chair to oversee Mueller, and there's no indication whether that's occurred or not. So, again, in every one of these scenarios, we have a sort of a trapdoor. So we have a potential conflict of interest there. And when Correct. it comes to Jeff Sessions, chief of staff, who is that? Uh, it, well, that was uh, an individual who was a political appointee by the Attorney General himself. Of course, Jeff Sessions has recused himself uh, precisely because of an apparent conflict of interest, that being a meeting that he had with a Russian envoy. So how uh, could he appoint the guy or woman who would oversee the Mueller probe if he had to recuse himself to begin with? It's a fair question. And do you have an answer? <laughs> Yeah. I, As I Patrick said, we're don't. in uncharted territory, and at this point it's not even clear if Rod Rosenstein will be actually leaving on Thursday. One of the, the, the predicates for this latest development is that Rosenstein, according to uh, New York Times reporting and then Washington Post reporting, either joked or said sarcastically or said seriously that he contemplated wearing a wire in the White House. and possibly a, w a vehicle to invoke the 25th uh, Amendment to remove the president. First of all, can, can one joke about that in that circumstance? I mean, the, the short answer would be you shouldn't joke about it in that circumstance, and particularly um, given the environment we're in. Um, you know, as a purely technical matter, when you have a probe where someone's deemed a subject or a target, wearing a wire is the way that you get evidence uh, on that person. But joking about it, if that's in fact what happened, and so much of this with anonymous source reporting, 
We don't really know what happened. We saw a denial by Mr. Rosenstein, but if you nitpick that denial, it's unclear exactly what he was denying. But certainly in this matter, uh, given the players here and given the gravity of the matter, you shouldn't be joking about it. So he's a DOJ guy, Department of Justice. Do Department of Justice lawyers traditionally wear wires in any investigation that you uh, know of? Uh, lawyers typically are not agents, so they're not uh, investigators out in the field. They're also not typically witnesses. In fact, they go to great lengths not to be witnesses. So it would be highly unusual for the Deputy Attorney General to wear a wire in a conversation with the President of the United States, even if, uh, as Patrick said, in a technical matter, it is uh, an indiv individual ex investigating a target of an investigation. And, and Patrick, just thinking of investigations you have done, what kind of hoop would you have to go through to get approval from a judge, I presume, for that kind of over here? No, I mean, a consensual recording um, would not require you to go to a judge. If, if an individual wears a wire, if the you The FBI could simply wire you up. Correct. I mean, again, we're in uncharted waters. Mr. Rosenstein, at that time, is the highest ranking official in the investigation, so he is the boss. Um, of the investigation. So he could authorize himself? I, I, I mean, again, I, there's no requirement to go to a judge, let's put it that way. There's no requirement to go to a judge if I'm wiring up on you. If I tap your phone, then we have to go to a judge. Can you think of a single circumstance that replicates what we're talking about no. here? I mean, in Chicago, it was just remarkable to get permission to overhear sitting judges in Cook County to wire up on a president, even if you're the boss who's who's authorizing these things it just seems uh, astonishing so yes and again I Carol we have to say all this we we don't know that's in fact what he said or if he said it at all if he said it sarcastically um, or the circumstances under which he said it Juliet is the Mueller probe at risk it could be uh, if Mr. Rosenstein departs the Department of Justice on Thursday, he has been protective of the independence and the integrity of the Mueller investigation. Robert Mueller reports to Rod Rosenstein, and if Rod Rosenstein is no longer the top official with regard to the special counsel investigation, it's possible that he will be replaced by somebody who is biased, a political hack, determined to end the investigation, or all of the above. And in fact, whoever replaced him, if he ultimately is replaced, could simply withdraw all resources and support, correct? Wouldn't have to say something, you would just have to withdraw the funds. I think the way a sophisticated person who was trying to undermine the investigation would do it is yes, you bleed the resources, you put deadlines on there, you increase bureaucracy, you increase hoops you have to jump through. I mean, that does happen in the real world when someone comes in and is trying to uh, either slow play or end an investigation. That's how you really do it in a way that is harder to scream obstruction um, in that regard. But my, you know, my sense of this this whole matter is, um, Mr. Mueller, whoever's supervising him, you know, has a limited window here to get his work done, um, and I, I think that's sort of the game we're in right now. Both of you have been members of the Department of Justice as assistant U.S. attorneys. What does it do inside an organization? What's happening inside the Department of Justice as all of this plays out on a national, international stage? What happens to lawyers inside, to prosecutors, to staffers? Well, there are 25,000 lawyers working at the Department of Justice. They are not political appointees. They're dedicated civil servants and public servants. Uh, does this have uh, an effect on morale? Do the events of the last 18 months have any effect on morale? It's, it's hard to say that they wouldn't. Um, that said, I think most of the lawyers that we know are keeping their heads down and doing their good work. Patrick? I have the same instinct. I mean, could it affect morale? Um, yes or no? Um, likely yes. But I think the day-to-day -day people are there to, you know, I never thought my, my boss was George Bush or Bill Clinton or who are the two presidents uh, I served under at several levels below. I, it was my job to go in every day and do my job. I could see the reaction being, because of all this turmoil up at the top, I'm actually going to do more now to, to sort of keep things going. Or I could see someone being completely disenchanted and saying, I. I can't, that guy's picture that I have to pass every day is, is one that I have difficulty serving. So I could see a cut in both ways, but I actually think there's so many professionals in the department
that former image of going and putting your head down and doing the work is, is the more likely one. I can't let you go without talking about the Kavanaugh case and this question because you both have dealt with the FBI extensively in your careers. Is the only way the FBI can be launched in this Kavanaugh controversy for the president to ask the FBI to engage? Is there any mechanism by which the FBI generates its own probe? Well, the FBI is part of the executive branch, and ordinarily a request by the president would be unnecessary for the FBI to investigate uh, any matter that bears on potential violations of criminal law. In this instance, we're talking about an individual who has been nominated by the president to serve on the highest court of the land. So is there a method short of a direct request by the president for his nominee? I'm not sure. And again, uncharted territory, as Patrick said. Do you have a theory about this? <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a theory. I mean, I, I uh, as a citizen, I, I would like a, an appropriate investigation. I, I'm not one who believes the FBI has to do it. I don't think there's a, there's not a federal criminal law at, at issue here. Obviously, the FBI does background checks all the time. They get enrolled. They get involved in the background matter. I understand with Anita Hill, there was some form of investigation. I mean, the reality is, if you step back, we're in this hyper, hyper political environment right now. These allegations came in. Dr. Wolf, I think, did everything the right way. Um, how they came into the government, um, I think, could have been done much better. But now that we're at the 11th hour, and um, it looks like we're going to have testimony on Thursday. And is there an, another corollary kind of investigative organization or, or department that if it's not the FBI, it would be somebody else? Well, Congress, of course, has subpoena power, and they have the ability to call witnesses, and witnesses testify under oath. Do they have the resources, the investigative training and experience of the FBI or other federal agencies? Definitely not. But the Judiciary Committee does investigations. I mean, they subpoena witnesses. There was, there's nothing preventing them from subpoenaing a lot of witnesses. I think the politics of this show that the people in charge of the Judiciary Committee don't want to do a full-blown investigation, whether that would be appropriate or not, is, is another question. But um, they can certainly do uh, an investigation. And have you seen investigation of theirs that you thought were professional and and thoroughgoing? I mean, do they have that capacity? I'm not an expert on the Judiciary Committee. I, I, I have seen them do investigations where multiple witnesses are subpoenaed, documents are requested. Um, that, that does happen. It happens pretty regularly. And going back to the fact that you are both two former members of a part of the Department of Justice. Have you ever seen this kind of criticism of a sitting president of his attorney general in your experience in government? <laughs> again, I have to say no to that. And I have to say again, as a citizen and a former member of the department, what bothers me most about all of this is just the fact that there is there's no acknowledgement of the line between the Department of Justice and maybe the Department of Commerce. I think, you know, there's a sense, and maybe this is us drinking our Kool-Aid, that, you know, you just don't meddle with the department. Uh, yes, on policy matters, whether gun violence or drugs are going to be your priority, that's certainly a fair game for the president to dictate. But on matters of public corruption, who should be charged with insider trading, um, when, is, is not fair game. Juliette Sorensen and Patrick Collins, thank you both for being here. Thank you for racing through traffic to get here. I know it was a challenge. Thanks to both of you. We'll be back with more on Chicago Tonight in just a moment. Stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by the City Club of Chicago. Smart people may disagree about what makes a great city, but part of what makes Chicago great is that we don't have to agree. To run a city like ours, a lot of issues come up. The City Club of Chicago is a place to debate those issues and hear from the men and women who shape the policies, lead the industries, and tell the stories that define our city. For the free and open exchange of ideas, the City Club of Chicago. Illinois has made a lot of changes in recent years to increase voter turnout with laws like electronic voter registration and same-day voter registration. That all lets residents register to vote and vote on Election Day. But there's another law that was supposed to make registering to vote even easier, but advocates say something happened to it on the way to getting implemented. Chicago Tonight's Amanda Vinicky is here with more. Amanda? 
what's going on? Well, of all of those, this was supposed to be the pinnacle of those modernizing voter registration laws. And this is automatic voter registration. Which on one hand is pretty much just exactly what it sounds like. And then, as you're soon going to learn, Paris, it gets more complicated than that. Following extensive negotiations, Illinois legislators overwhelmingly passed this bill last summer. Governor Bruce Rauner then signed it into law. It was supposed to have been in place in time for the upcoming general election this November. The law's sponsors, though, are upset it won't be. This is something that should have been implemented already. There's no reason uh, for this delay. Amanda, what's behind this delay? Well, advocates actually say that it's Secretary of State Jesse White who is to blame. They say he knew that this was coming and that they've had a bunch of meetings, but that White's office is pushing back the implementation until next summer, July or August of 2019, after not only the November elections, but then off to also after the race for Chicago mayor as well. The criticism's notable, seeing as White himself is on the November ballot. He's quite popular in Illinois also, and so it is rare to see members of his own party criticizing him. He is running for a record sixth term. He's up against Republicans nominee Jason Helland. He's the Grundy County State's attorney. All right, Amanda, if the law passed with overwhelming support from Democrats, Jesse White, as you mentioned, a prominent Democrat, why the delay? Well, that's the thing. White's office says it is doing what it is supposed to. In a statement, his office said the fact is the AVR program is up and running. It is going very well. Anyone who wishes to register to vote may do so. His office says that since it rolled out the program in July, it has seen registration rates double. White is referencing changes this summer that basically automated the registration process, such that when individuals go to the DMV to get or to update a driver's license, their updated information automatically goes to elections authorities. In the Secretary of State's eyes, White has done the heavy lifting on AVR. But that's not good enough for advocates with groups like the Illinois Campaign for Political Reform and the Public Interest Research Group. Yes, they appreciate that drivers' facilities moved away from paper to an electronic process, but they say there's more to do. They say Illinois is still requiring would-be voters to opt into registering. But the cornerstone of automatic registration is that it's automatic so that only those who opt out are not registered. The way automatic voter registration should work is the simplest process for individuals without having to take as many proactive steps or actions. Those little administrative steps, together they build up and make the process more complicated. And why can't White's office do that earlier? When I spoke with his spokesman this afternoon, he indicated that it is tied to real ID concerns. Now, that's the federal law that sets standards for the types of ID cards, say driver's licenses, that U.S. Homeland Security will accept to let someone on a plane. Illinois, as well as other states, had to seek several extensions. Illinois just applied for another one. White's spokesman says the office needs time to make sure that people who are not citizens but maybe get a temporary driver's license and therefore because they're not citizens they're not eligible to vote that they aren't automatically registered advocates are still not pacified though i think it's absolutely necessary to ensure that our citizens in the state of illinois have their voices heard at the ballot box we have very important elections coming up you know for the next few years and we just want to make sure that people have their right to vote accessible and there. So Secretary of State, Secretary of State uh, White, please, please, please make sure that we're actually getting this done when your team said that they were going to get it done. So largely it does come down to a matter of timing. The advocates say that if anything, Real ID and AVR should come at the same time. There's no need for automatic registration to come later. Now as for the Real ID issue, no worries, you can still use your Illinois license to board a plane for a while, but Illinois will offer new Real ID compliant driver's licenses starting next spring. It'll likely be October of 2020 before you'll need one of those Real ID licenses in order to travel by air. So Amanda, add this problem into with election judges say, or election authorities saying they need more election judges. We got some issues with the voter infrastructure here in Illinois, so we'll keep track of all that. Thank you very that much. That we will, sure.
And still to come on Chicago Tonight, local scientists are finding a new, almost foolproof way to identify whether someone has a concussion. The ruins of the former Pilgrim Baptist Church in Bronville, there it is, get an all-star boost on the way to becoming a gospel museum. And a visit from our friends at the Chicago Botanic Garden with ideas for fall. But first, we are going to take a short break to ask for your support of this program and to tell you how you can get tickets to a very special Chicago Tonight event. Here's Eddie Arusa. Ostensibly, the Great Recession ended in 2009, but one sector in the Chicagoland area... Uh, in that block. I can hear the uh, audio from this one. Hello, Chicago Tonight viewers. I'm Eddie Arusa. You may not know this, but you are behind every decision we make. But after not. almost a decade, it would still spook a lot of people, spook some markets, and it would have some impact on regular folk. What, what yes. impact would it have? Well, whether it's on air or online or both, we cover everything from earthly interests like business stories and neighborhood issues to out-of-this-world pursuits, and you won't find this kind of local coverage in any other city. Chicago Tonight stands alone but we need you to stand with us. You know that independent, unbiased journalism is more important than ever before. On Friday, October 19th, join me and my Chicago Tonight colleagues for a fun, behind-the-scenes look at the coming elections. We'll explore the campaigns and the candidates in a freewheeling discussion, and you can join in the conversation as well. Here's how. For a donation of $100, you will receive a ticket to this event at the WTTW Studios in Chicago. Please go online now at WTTW.com slash news or call 773-588-1111 to sign up. Any amount helps keep Chicago Tonight strong, but if you contribute $100, you will receive a ticket to this unique event. Tickets are limited, so don't miss this opportunity. Again, it's Friday, October 19th at our WTTW studios. For more than 30 years, Chicago Tonight has connected you to your community and you can trust us to bring you in-depth, unbiased coverage of the stories you care about most. We can only do it with your help. So please go online now at WTTW.com slash news or call 773-588-1111 to reserve a seat at $100 each for our Chicago Tonight behind the scenes look at the coming election. You can join in the conversation and meet the whole Chicago Tonight team. Thank you for supporting the work we do and I look forward to meeting you in October. You're going to want to pay attention to this next segment if you have kids in fall sports like football, soccer, and lacrosse. Concussions have become a major worry in recent years. New research out of Northwestern University could prove to be a game changer in detecting concussions, especially in kids. A team of auditory neuroscientists there have found that by measuring how the brain processes sound, it could indicate whether or not someone has suffered some sort of head trauma. Joining us to talk about this new groundbreaking research is Nina Krauss, who heads up the Auditory Neuroscience Lab, better known as the Brain Volts Lab at Northwestern University. Dr. Krauss, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. So first, tell us the connection between concussions and hearing. So making sense of sound is one of the hardest jobs that we ask our brain to do. Sound, as you know, consists of information that's happening very quickly, and the brain has to compute what is happening with these sound waves in microseconds. And so you can imagine that if you get hit in the head, um, this very delicate, complex machinery is likely to get disrupted and in fact, it often does. So it's more complex, in concussion tests, you see you know, the finger waving, it's more complex than, than visual well, cues? So, so this is interesting because uh, you know, in concussion, we, we've been using uh, balance tests, cognitive mm -hmm. tests, visual tests, mm -hmm. and now we would like to add hearing auditory tests to the, 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 the suite of measures that can inform us about athlete And health. this is what you focused on. So tell us what your study found. Well, um, if we measure the brain's response to sound, of course, as I'm talking to you now, the nerves in your brain um, uh, are producing electricity. And with sensors, with scalp electrodes, we can measure how your brain responds to sound. So we can do this in athletes after they have sustained a concussion and what we can find is that um, the way in which sound is typically processed can become disrupted 
and that um, as symptoms uh, resolve, uh, we also find that the sound processing resolves. This is often accompanied also by difficulty really making sense of sound so that if um, you know, I, I ask you to repeat back a sentence that is presented to you in a noisy background, mm -hmm. lots of people talking, um, if you have sustained a concussion, your ability to perform those kinds of tests is also diminished. Well, you had some pretty staggering numbers here. So tell us the, the percentage of people that had disruption in the way they process sound if they had a concussion. Well, um, so these were in, uh, in individuals who had persistent symptoms. So it, most concussions will resolve within a week. Mm -hmm. um, but in the athletes who continued to have symptoms, uh, we found that you know, we were able to, um, in 90% in of these athletes who continued to have symptoms, we were able to determine that um, sound processing in the brain, which you can think about as a measure of brain health, that the sound processing in the brain was uh, disrupted. And then you said in 95, but you had a control group where 95% where uh, their sound was fine, the 95% yeah. that didn't have any concussive symptoms. Right. So, you know, uh, I can have various kinds of control groups, but, uh, you know, typically we will have uh, individuals who are in uh, the same sports medicine clinic who have uh, musculoskeletal injuries. Um, so, yeah, it, it's just in the individuals Pretty who... Pretty close and shut case here. Uh, tell me, you alluded to this a second ago, what does it sound like when you're heavily concussed? Uh, well, it's difficult to, to put oneself into another person's head. Sure. Right? But like um, a conversation and, okay, well, in me, a noisy environment. Yeah. Well, let me, let me just say one thing. I mean, what... So, I can ask you to repeat back sentences mm -hmm. that are presented in a noisy environment mm -hmm. and you can tell me what you hear and I can make the noise louder and we also know what is, what is typical. And if you are performing um, worse than I would expect someone of your age and sex to perform, um, then I, I, I know that you're having some difficulty. What is beautiful about the biological measure, which uh, we call the FFR, it's a frequency following response, what we um, can measure is it's, it's objective. It's 100% mm -hmm. objective. So As it, opposed to other concussion tests, uh, which are sort of subjective, right? There's ways around them. Well, there are ways around them, but also, I mean, if you've just been injured, um, you know, it, it's, it might be hard or confusing to perform a task. Mm -hmm. Whereas, so the athletes love to uh, take our... Uh, brain measure because they get to sleep. They just get to rest. While they're and, doing your test. Yeah, and so we deliver sound into the ear and we have these sensors on and they can just relax. And, uh, you know, so we're, we're testing a lot of athletes now at the, the preseason. We have a, um, um, a grant from the National Institutes of Health where we're testing um, all of the uh, over 500 of uh, Northwestern's athletes. If, if you're an athlete and, and you're confused as, as to whether you've had a concussion, a telltale sign, you say 90% is if you are having trouble processing someone's conversation with you, say in a bar or a restaurant or a noisy environment. Yes, um, but again, uh, you know, you can have this, let me just say yes. Yes, okay. So you were going to qualify that a little bit? No, I, it's just, you know, I wanted to draw the distinction between a behavioral measure right. where you're actually testing somebody, uh, somebody's ability to hear sound or some, you know, the, the, uh, it, uh, some signal in a noisy environment mm -hmm. and the brain's ability to actually process biologically um, the details of sound. Right. And you, you mentioned all the work you're doing with Northwestern athletes. You're, uh, you're, you're testing everybody, everybody, football, lacrosse, yeah. soccer. Is there anything that's uh, surprised you in, in your research uh, on, on a grand scale? Yeah. Well, you know, so we have just begun a, um, a longitudinal study. Uh, this is funded, again, by, by uh, the NIH um, that is testing all male and female athletes uh, in uh, high and low impact sports, and this will be over five years. So we've been following the football players the last two years, um, and you know, over the next several years, I expect that we are going to uh, learn a lot about uh, what can happen or not 
um, after an individual sustains a concussion. So, you know, for example, we can, the, 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 the protocol is to test everyone at the beginning and at the end of the season, mm -hmm. and then individuals who get and a concussion get um, uh, monitored very carefully. In this long-term test, so you're going beyond uh, your Audible study, but you're, ta you're looking at the long-term health effects of, no, of concussion? No, we're looking at, um, well, I mean, we're, we're looking at the long-term effects of, of, of being in um, you know, what you might even think of as, as sub-concussive um, injuries, mm -hmm. possibly, mm -hmm. um, if you're playing a high-impact sport. Um, but we're also looking at um, the, the long-term effects, um, possibly, of individuals who have sustained concussions over time. But generally, we find that um, the, 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 the hearing, the, the biological symptoms resolve as the, um, as, as the uh, symptoms of the athlete are also resolving. So this isn't something, I mean, you've, we've, we've seen a lot of reports of athletes with multiple concussions and they start to have behavioral problems, they start to have depression. This is something that's regenerative, so the, the audio yeah. problems well, actually can restore. Well, we are, um, that's something that we really we're we're, we're needing, we're needing to find out, but realize that, you know, so on the one hand, this is a measure can, that can inform diagnosis. It can inform um, when an athlete is ready to return to learn or return to play. Um, and it can inform, you know, different treatments because there are different ways of treating a concussion. Um, so, you know, we're, we're really in a position now um, to, you know, having established the effect that in fact um, we, we see that a concussion will uh, change sound processing in the brain, we can follow that in individual people over time. I think that's an important point you're trying to make is that you can, you can determine if someone's had a concussion, especially a kid, uh, when their hearing comes back it might be a sign that okay, that it's safe for them to go play again. Exactly, instance. exactly. All right. Well, Dr. Krauss, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. My pleasure. And Dr. Krauss will speak about how music and con concussions impact brain health tomorrow night at the South Shore Cultural Center as part of a Science in the Parks initiative presented by the Chicago Park District and the Chicago Council on Science and Technology. You can find more details about that up on our website. And next, big news in the world of gospel music, so stick around. Coverage of Science and Technology on Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Joel M. Friedman, President of the Alvin H. Baum Family Fund. Twelve years after a devastating fire gutted Chicago's historic Pilgrim Baptist Church, plans for its resurrection seem to be moved forward. Organizers of a project to transform the ruins into a new museum of gospel music say they'll be making some major announcements this week as some of the biggest names in gospel music come to Chicago to add their voices to these ambitious plans. Eddie Aruza has the story. The spirit of Mahalia Jackson and a legion of other legendary gospel singers still hover over 31st and Indiana. The site of the former Pilgrim Baptist Church is only a shell of its historic past, propped up by steel girders. But there's growing optimism that a phoenix is ready to rise from the ashes. We are ahead of schedule, which I'm glad to say. In February 2006, a roofer's blowtorch sparked a massive fire that destroyed the historic building, consuming everything but its heavy stone walls. Originally designed as a synagogue in 1890 by Chicago's legendary Louis Sullivan and Dankmar Adler, the temple became a Baptist church in the 1920s. And it was there that music director Thomas Dorsey is credited with giving birth to gospel music. Honoring that musical legacy is what museum organizers have committed to, and they now say several foundations are ready to make good on financing the dream. They're making the decision on how much and when, um, but these are sizable. These are around the average of 10 million per foundation. The museum's chairman says he's not ready to divulge the names of potential donors, but he will say the cost of the project has ballooned to $45 million after a parking lot was added to the plans. But there's one thing organizers say has been missing from securing funds. Many of uh, the foundations and our donors are asking, well, what is the gospel music community? Where are they behind the project? I mean, we haven't heard from them. 
The gospel music community is responding. This coming Thursday, a number of the biggest names in gospel will give a benefit concert in Chicago to show their support for the museum. It's a roster that the museum's chairman has on speed dial. In addition to leading the way on the museum project, Don Jackson has been producing the Stellar Gospel Music Awards for 33 years. It will be the biggest roster of gospel music artists, stars, uh, that has ever been assembled. While the interior of the church changed over the years, its Jewish origins remain carved into the still standing walls, as well as on the cornerstone, which marks both 5650 and 1890 as the year of construction. And Don Jackson says a leading Jewish foundation is making a contribution to keep that legacy alive. If the museum proceeds on track, it will be only the second African-American museum in the state after the DuSable Museum. And Jackson says the city and state are offering generous help. The city is uh, saying they're trying to do 10 million, and the state, they're also trying to do 10 million. Jackson says whatever public money the museum gets will likely be in the form of TIF and development funds. He also says that the museum will not be just a traditional exhibit space. The mission is to create a performing arts safe haven environment. So it's not just artifacts and exhibits. Uh, we are really looking for our youth to benefit from this. In short, the organizers hope to rekindle the spirit of the past while giving hope to the future. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Eddie Aruza. The Gospel Museum says it hopes to have enough contributions to start the project about this time next year, adding that a grand opening two years from now remains their goal. You can learn more about the project and the upcoming free concert on Thursday on our website. The fall season brings challenges and opportunities to local gardeners. Joining us now with tips on how to make the most of the season is Eliza Fournier of the Chicago Botanic Garden. Eliza, welcome back. Good to see you. It's great to be here, Paris. Okay, I got to admit, I'm, I'm kind of intimidated by all the stuff we have here. So let's let's start over here. Sure. Your first tip for us uh, for the fall is to cut. Um, uh, get some cuttings from annuals and take them inside. Sure, yeah. Why do you want to do that? Well, it's starting to get, even though it doesn't feel like it, it's starting to get cooler and we do, especially overnight, we're getting into the 40s overnight, so the start time to shift our thinking and we're officially in fall now. Right. So we're moving into a different season in the garden. So um, one what, thing, what do you have here? This is a coleus. This okay. is an annual plant. But the cool thing about this coleus is that if you want to get a head start on next year's season, you can just take a cutting off of it Mm -hmm. And you can see we got a head start. We we cheated a little bit. So we you cut just cut this. a little branch yeah, off of I your coleus. Cut coli a branch off your coleus. Put it in some water, and pretty soon it'll start to grow these amazing roots just right off of the stem. So this is in lieu of buying a new plant yeah. next summer. Yeah, and keeping something interesting going over the summer. And if you just haven't gotten enough of gardening this year, you can keep it going. Okay, so what's the best way to keep it going inside? So you'd basically just get some potting soil and a small pot, and you just wind it around and plant it in this pot. Hmm. And I would actually prune it down, mm -hmm. take this whole part off so it doesn't have to work so hard to get the water all the way up to all those right. leaves. And it'll start to get bushier and you can have this over winter. And then when you're ready in the spring, take it back out again and you have a good head start. All right, you also said that it should be uh, in a south facing window. Does it have to be south facing? Um, that That's the, especially we're so that's light ideal. limited mm -hmm. in the winter. And so it, being in a south facing window is really, really nice. If you don't, if, east and west works too. North is not so great. Okay, so now here you've got some tomatoes and cukes, and uh, is, it, is, it, is it like about time to start pulling yeah. up these vegetables? Yeah, not to fret. There's still a couple, maybe a couple weeks, but you'll start to notice that things aren't ripening as quickly. We're at entering that period where things, tomatoes stay green a little longer, your peppers mm -hmm. aren't blushing, and that's okay. You take them, this tomato for example, um, you can, if it's this green, just bring it inside, harvest it, See, so the, half the time the squirrels eat on it, you know, oh. and you don't, you want to get it where it's nice. You don't want those squirrels to get it. Bring right. it inside, turn it upside down, and pretty soon this green will start to blush more red and ripen on your countertop, which is really nice. Okay, now what if we get some of these early frosts that we tend to get starting in October, or early November? Well, this is when we gardeners start to get 
antsy and we are looking at our phones all the time not to see if we got the most recent you know Twitter, Twitter feed, right. but it's more like what's the weather gonna be is it gonna frost tonight what, right. let's get these plants in um, but there's still lots to do in the garden lots of fun stuff to still to be had all right, so now you have, you have okay, over here you have herbs, yeah. right? Yeah, so this is, you also might, in your vegetable garden, herbs I think are another lovely thing. They're still going strong in the garden. They're really pretty. We've got some sage right here, some parsley in the front, mm -hmm. um, a little rosemary, and some so of these. So you can pr plant this now, and this, this is safe for fall and winter? You kind of don't want to, this is when it starts to get a little dicey for these guys too, because okay. they're warm season, they're Mediterranean climate. They don't mm -hmm. want to be outside so okay. much. So some can stand, handle, some are perennials, like the sage, mm -hmm. the uh, the parsley will reseed and I'll stay, but you might want to dig up things like basil, mm -hmm. um, your rosemary, and bring them inside, and then you can continue to harvest on them inside, and that frost won't affect them so much. Okay, now I see you moving toward uh, this uh, yeah. beautiful thing right here. Yeah. Th uh, this is a mum? Yeah, things you can plant. Now is a great time. If you go to the garden center, you're going to see lots of gorgeous like colors and the garden centers have gotten so creative on how to make containers and what plants are there. Mm -hmm. So the mum's kind of the traditional, the standard, looks really good. It's gonna be around for a long time into the fall. Mm -hmm. It's a great plant. Okay, and then now here you've got uh, plants uh, that you can, or vegetables that you can plant yeah. for the fall and winter. Absolutely, so there's a ton of plants that you can still plant right now and continue to harvest that won't die. So if you had Swiss chard, I love Swiss chard. Swiss chard, okay. It's really, really great because you can plant it in this early, early spring, like in March, and it loves hot weather, it loves cool weather, and it'll survive through a frost too. So Swiss chard's a great workhorse for the garden. Um, and then there's other things that you can plant. We have some Hakurai turnips in the front here. Mm -hmm. You can see them peeking out of the pot. Uh, so these will survive a frost, cute. or Beep. multiple frosts. Yeah, they're tough. They're they're, they're built tough. for that. Peas, sweet peas. Sweet peas are actually, a lot of crops are better mm -hmm. after the frost. Like if, if you've ever, um, Brussels sprouts. Mm -hmm. Brussels sprouts stay in the garden all season long, and they're actually, you want to wait until after that frost comes, because then all of the sugars go into your crop, mm -hmm. and that makes for a much more delicious A much vegetable. tastier yeah. Brussels sprout. Yeah. So you don't, have to, you don't have to dress it up with oil and salt, and you could just, just I mean, grow I it in the, wouldn't, in the I wouldn't recommend against that, because right. that always makes everything better. But the other thing is you, carrots. You can plant carrots now, mm -hmm. leave them in the ground over the winter, and they'll get super, super sweet. You harvest them in spring, and they're wow. delish. Okay, so now you have a bag of uh, mulch here. Remind oh, us why mulching yes. is so important. Um, I don't want to get this. is just beautiful. This is leaf mulch from the Botanic Garden. I don't. You got to smell it. You got. Uh, definitely, has got a smell it's to earthy, it. It's earthy, isn't it? It's is earthy. Mm. Mm -hmm. So this is mulch will help to um, prevent your perennial plants, so the ones that come back every year from heaving out of the ground. It'll provide that consistent temperature. It'll keep weeds down. It's a great, great prevent your perennial plants. That was nice. Um, you like alliteration? Alliteration. Yeah. 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 Like that. So you're an English major as well as Indeed. a botanist. Yeah. Okay. Um, so now you you recommend planting uh, bulbs for yes. next spring yes. and summer now. Yes. Why is that? And what do uh, we have? Well, these bulbs are a nice little seed that they're actually a, I like to call them a little lunchbox of um, nutrients and they'll win, they'll stay all winter providing no squirrels, mm -hmm. dig them up and you want to plant them with the pointy end up. This was where the roots will come out. Okay. And sometimes you forget where they're planted so I recommend putting a little marker. Ah. Where yeah, I would definitely planted. forget. Yeah, yeah, and you don't want to dig them up next spring. Um, you want them to come up and provide beautiful color. And so, so if you plant them now, when are they going to come up? Like in well, time depends. for April or May? Yeah, April, May. It depends on the bulb. And the good news is, at the bulb sale at the Botanic Garden, not this weekend, but the October fifth, sixth, and seventh, um, you can come and there's tons of bulb experts on hand and a lot of um, varieties, tulips, daffodils that you can't find everywhere. So I highly recommend people coming up, All checking right. it out. All right. Okay. Now over here you have containers. So you're recommending. Yeah. Uh, putting a lot of uh, plants and flowers in container for the next few months to make make your porch look really yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah. This is, probably by now our geraniums, our sweet potato vines, our pa uh, petunias. They're looking a little bit leggy. They're looking a little bit scraggly. Mm -hmm. So let's take those out and start fresh with some gorgeous. Um, I love putting kale in. Lots of different varieties of ornamental kale. Um, they here we have the garden put in some beautiful sage for some texture. Um, I like this combination of perennials. We have some sedum here, um, some violas, this beautiful grass, and it was just, you would follow the same um, planting design 
it, principles as you would. You want the, the thrillers in the, the thrillers, the fillers, and then the spillers that go over the side for thrillers, a beautiful. Thrillers, fillers, and spillers. Yes, for a beautiful fall so, display. So that's the key. Thriller, yep. filler, spiller. Yep. That's how you make it look like an impressionist uh, painting. Absolutely. It's painting. Okay, so fall. Is it a good time to plant shrubs and trees? Yeah, you absolutely can plant shrubs and trees right now. Um, the great news is they're not going to get stressed out by not having enough water or the heat. Um, so now's a great time. Just mm -hmm. remember, mulch. 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 I've learned my lesson. There you go. I'm sure Phil is at home mulching right now. Uh, he is 100%. If he's not watching the show, that's what he's doing. I guarantee Phil is mulching right now. All right, Eliza Fournier, <laughs> thank you so much for the tips. Thanks for having me. And we're back to wrap things up right after this. Don't ever miss Chicago Tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight Podcast and subscribe. I learned a lot in that segment. And that's our show for this Monday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily e-alert and briefing. And join us tomorrow night live at 7. The U.S. government may soon take up a more aggressive and preemptive cyber warfare strategy. And on the comeback trail with one of Chicago's hottest jazz singers. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Paris Schutz, and I thank you for watching. Good night. Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices. Bob Clifford is on the board of overseers of the Rand Institute for Civil Justice, a think tank in California.